Professor Eric uh, Kaufman, who is in fact Canadian, is a professor of politics at uh, Birkbeck College uh, here in uh, London. And uh, among his publications are themes of unionism uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, the rise and fall of Anglo-Americanism, uh, and he is editor of uh, a journal called Nations and Nationalism. And he's currently working on responses of the British working class to uh, issues of, uh, of diversity. Uh, Eric is going to speak first for up to about uh, 20 minutes, uh, and followed by um, uh, Dr. Okay. So please, Eric, go ahead. Thank you, William, and uh, I want to thank the uh, Dialogue Foundation for bringing me here today. Uh, konnichiwa. That's my. I, I should say that I've. Uh, I did spend about eight early years of my life in Japan because my father was with the Canadian Embassy there, and then later with uh, some Canadian firms. But uh, my Japanese, alas, has not lasted very well. I do know the odd phrase, though. So sorry, this will be in English. Um, right. So. I'm just going to say a few words about nationalism, uh, a bit about nationalism in this country, and then maybe I'll draw out the odd little comparison with Japan. So by nationalism then, um, what we're speaking about um, is a movement, well, a movement for attaining identity, unity, or autonomy. This is lifted from Anthony Smith, who's one of the leading scholars of nationalism was also my doctoral supervisor at the LSE. Uh, so what nationalism then is about, it doesn't have to be about your own country. Separation, it might be about separation, but it could also be about either unif unification or it can be about cultural revival. So it doesn't have to be political, it could be cultural as well. It doesn't have, nationalism does not have to take place in a classical French mode of top-down, state-imposed, elite-driven nationalism. It is also possible to have more organic, bottom-up, popular nationalism, um, which can be stimulated not necessarily by elites, but sometimes by associations, churches, religious organizations, uh, and even by the mass market. So it doesn't have to be a state-driven, elite-driven thing. Uh, I want to kind of make one important distinction, if I may, which I think is relevant, particularly when we're comparing Japan to this country. And that is, there's two important <coughs> components to the nation and to national identities, just as there are two important components to our own identities as human beings, as individuals. One is how we relate to other people in space, if you like. So I don't want to be like my brother or my father, uh, especially if I'm a twin, I have to differentiate myself. That's a boundary problem in space. So nations have to find out ways in which they're different from other nations in the, in the here and now in space. And that really is more the problem that Britain faces today. So I'll talk about that in a minute. Then you have a second issue, which is not about space, but it's about time. It's about memory in the past. Um, so if you think about, again, going back to the individual, things that happened to you in your early life, your relationship with your parents in the past, traumatic things that happened to you, all of those are very important for your identity. The ups and downs, wins and losses, pride, loss, those sorts of things. So that time dimension, memory, collective memory, is also important for nations. Uh, how does a nation deal with its past is a very important theme. I would argue that this is more of a problem for Japan than for Britain. It's not to say that Britain doesn't have issues with its past, um, and it's not to say that's not important for, for nationalism here in the UK. But I think the problem in Britain is more one of who are we. The problem in Japan is more one of how do we relate to our past Okay, so just then to say a little bit about um, Britain, which is what I've been asked to talk about, nationalism in Britain. I am Canadian, yes, but I think I've lived here for almost 20 years, so I can say something about um, the UK. So the reason that boundaries, that is the space problem uh, of identity, is so important in Britain, yeah, 
several several reasons. There's been there have been a number of challenges. One, of course, is separatism, particularly Scottish separatism, but also to some extent Welsh assertions as well. Questioning the idea of Britain. Uh, going along with this is the, the decline of the British Empire, but in particular, Scottish devolution, the rise of the Scottish National Party. Uh, you're aware that there's a, the leader of the SNP, the Scottish Nationalists, um, Alex Salmon, has called for a referendum in 2014. So this is a rising issue. Uh, if we look at public opinion in Britain, an increasing proportion of Scots say they are Scottish first and British second, if at all. 80% of Scots would place themselves, call themselves Scottish first. Partly in response to that, the proportion of people in England who call themselves English has increased a lot. 60% in the most recent, in the census, in the 2011 census, said that they were English, not British. Uh, sorry, English as well as British. Um, so it's partly a response to Scottish and Welsh nationalism that you're getting a rise in English nationalism. So here we have one challenge to the boundaries of what it means to be the whole the whole who are we question. What is an Englishman has come to be questioned because you have separatism. You also have, of course, the European Union. Um, now the European Union is not a super nation. It's not about to uh, dissolve the nation state, but there are certain areas in which uh, the powers of the European Union has superseded those of Britain, such as uh, in law, the European Court of Justice is the final court of appeal. So even if you don't get the decision you want uh, in the High Court in Britain, you can appeal to the European Court of Justice. So some might say that an element of sovereignty has been removed from Britain and devolved up to the level of Europe. You have the challenge of the Euro, although Britain didn't join the Euro, there were pressures to do so. Um, you have free movement of people within the European Union. Now, what I would argue about the European Union, however, is that it's not as important an issue as other issues that I'm going to speak about today. And the main, one of the reasons Europe is high on the agenda and the rise of the UK Independence Party is on the agenda is in part because freedom of movement within Europe is linked to the issue of immigration, which I'm going to talk about next. So immigration then is another is another very important theme in Britain post-1950. Um, and we can really date this back to the arrival of uh, large-scale immigra uh, immigration from the Caribbean and also from the Indian subcontinent, uh, beginning in 1948 with the arrival of the Windrush to, uh, to Britain, which is a ship which brought uh, Afro-Caribbean laborers to Britain, um, and the arrival of uh, workers from the Indian subcontinent, Pakistani, Indian, Bangladeshi, who went to work in textile mills initially, uh, although there were some merchants among them as well. Um, in response to this, we see a number of uh, events, such as the 1958 Notting Hill race riots, which largely were uh, instigated by white working class uh, English against Afro-Caribbean immigrants. Um, you have the rise of Enoch Powell, who was a politician who made a famous speech called the Rivers of Blood speech, which was warning against the evils of immigration. And he quotes, uh, in his speech, he, he says, as I look ahead, I'm filled with foreboding. Like the Roman, I seem to see the river Tiber foaming with much blood, essentially threatening that there would be uh, blood flowing in the streets if immigration from the non-white commonwealth were to continue at its high levels. And incidentally, if you look at public opinion surveys, 90% of the British population were opposed to current immigration levels uh, in 1970, at the, just the height of Powellism. Um, and there is this link between the volume of immigration and um, opposition to immigration. So during the period 1970, after uh, the initial wave of immigration, very high opposition in this country, to immigration. It then declines, the numbers of immigrants decline in the Thatcher period in particular, and opposition to immigration goes down from, say, the ninth, about 90% to more like 60%. Um, but then, be, beginning in the 1990s, there's an, another increase in a new wave of immigration that comes into Britain, uh, beginning largely with the Blair government. So when Tony Blair took office in 1997, uh, roughly 50,000 
But there was roughly a net immigration of 50,000 per year into Britain. As we get into the 2000s, that number was more like 200 to 250,000 a year. So you have a rapid increase then in the um, number of immigrants coming into the country. Now, some of that, of course, is simply due to open borders with Europe, particularly um, in the 2000s. But still, there was this perception within the population that immigration had risen to quite high levels. And so we see in the opinion surveys opposition to immigration goes back up. It's now somewhere, amongst the white British, it's somewhere in the low 80 percent. Uh, so almost at the level it was during the Powell period. Um, and this is a classic boundary question, a who are we question, you know, what defines uh, being English? Um, we already said the British Empire, there were, there's the collapse of the empire, you have separation in Scotland, Welsh nationalism, so that questions Britishness. But Englishness is also questioned because um, typically, people thought of an Englishman as someone with Anglo-Saxon ancestry, but that now can no longer be sustained when you have 20% of the population of non-Anglo-Saxon uh, origin in England. Um, and in fact, if you look at, at a place like London, the change is even more dramatic. So now London's population is 40% non-white, and it is 55% non-English in, in ethnic ancestry. Um, and the proportion of minorities has doubled in the last 10 years. So it's, it's the changes, the demographic changes are very dramatic. Again, throwing into relief that question, who are we? Whereas I think the question in Japan is not so much one of, of who are we as it is uh, one of how do we deal with the past, issues of national pride, so forth, which are more to do with the national narrative, the national story as it relates to history and the past. It's not to say that Britain doesn't have issues with its past. Um, there is still the lingering issue of the end of empire, Britain's place in the world. But I don't get the sense that those are the driving forces behind current English nationalism. Um, one other point to mention here is the issue of multiculturalism, which broke larger after 9-11 and after the 7-7-2000 terrorist bombings. Uh, and also with some of the rioting in the northern English mill towns after 2001. Uh, part of this then was a feeling um, in Britain, not just on the right but also in the center left, that the idea of celebrating difference was not actually a good idea. And, and so actually what's important is to stress unity and integration into a common national identity rather than emphasizing differences of identity within the population. And actually, a lot of these trends, I should say, cut pretty well across Europe and even into North America. So this shift, turn away from multiculturalism really is something that dates from the 1990s uh, across Europe. And it's partly also linked to the rise of the far right, which I won't talk too much about. After about 1987, across Western Europe, the far right uh, sees about a tripling of its support um, in particular amongst the old white working class. And that Britain, the far right is not as strong or has not traditionally been as strong in Britain because Britain has a, a first winner-take-all um, electoral system rather than a proportional representation system. So very hard for far right parties to get into the legislature. But still, if we look at the 2009 uh, European elections, the British National Party, which is a far right party, gained a million votes. Uh, in the London, Greater London elections of 2008, they gained 330,000 votes. And in some ways, the UK Independence Party, which is now doing extremely well, somewhere between, depending on the polls, 12 to 18 percent of the population say they would vote for UKIP. Um, a lot of their support is coming not on the issue of Europe, but actually on the issue of immigration. The reason people are voting, are, are motivated to vote for them, I believe, is not so much um, the po loss of political sovereignty to Europe as the fear of, of free movement of peoples within Europe and what that will mean, particularly with uh, Romanian accession and right to, to move within the EU in 2014. So I think there are a whole bunch of issues around boundaries of who are we questions, which are um, driving nationalism in this country as they're driving nationalism throughout the West, incidentally. It's the same issue in the United States, for example. Samuel Huntington wrote a book called Who Are We in 2004. Very similar themes about um, having a secure identity, whereas I think perhaps in Japan it's maybe more about the narrative and the memory. 
Um, with that, I'm just going to leave it. I don't know if I've gone over or if I've got some time left. Um, how am I doing? Uh, you're doing rather well, Eric. If you'd like another three or four minutes, three or four uh, minutes? Go ahead. Okay, uh, fine. Give it to us. Okay. <laughs> so, I guess in terms of this issue, that the broader issue uh, that we're talking about uh, of nationalism and value change, I think it's correct what Williams says, that nationalism isn't going away. Now, it is true that in the 1960s, uh, for various reasons, partly due to the student revolts, uh, there was a general, general decline in certain kinds of nationalist sentiment. If you look at your, you know, European value survey work, you can see that the number of people saying, I'm very proud of my country, declines in the 60s, and it declines more amongst younger people. And that's true in Japan, too, by the way, incidentally, as well as in Europe. Um, so there was a kind of decline of nationalism, but I think, I think that's partly, uh, you can have that decline, and at the same time you can have a rise in other forms of nationalism, such as cultural and ethnic nationalism, a, a fear that in some way a nation is losing its, its, its ethnic character, its cultural character. I think that is more the theme that exercises people in the West, or the mass public, particularly the working class in the West. Uh, so I think that's going on. I do think that the cultural dynamics which drove liberal movements such as multiculturalism and globalization, but especially multiculturalism, which originated in the 1960s, um, some of those cultural movements have lost force. Um, so I do think we are entering a new era where there's been a lot more criticism of multiculturalism in a way which was not which was not so prominent before. So I do think there is a, we're, we're in an uncertain period. That's not to say that nationalism is winning and has completely won the day. It's just to say that there is much more of a contested terrain between the sort of post-1960s uh, new left cultural liberalism, which emerges from the student movements, uh, and what's happened more recently, which is the rise of the far right, the turn amongst, not only amongst the masses, but also amongst intellectuals, particularly on the center left, against multiculturalism, uh, which only dates to the last 10 years or so. So there's more critics, uh, even in, in academia, of, of multiculturalism. And when you have David Cameron and Angela Merkel and others saying multiculturalism has failed, I think that's a reflection of the fact that within the elite, it's now acceptable to be against multiculturalism. Part of this, too, can't be divorced from the issue of Islam, from the from terrorism and issues that were very much alive in the early and mid-2000s. Uh, the Rushdie, beginning really with the Rushdie affair, the, the Danish cartoons, and so on and so forth, that has also, I think, contributed to uh, a decline of multiculturalism, in part because you can, you, you can attack multiculturalism from the perspective of being a liberal. So you could say, well, my, you know, multiculturalism allows illiberal groups to uh, practice illiberal traditions such as female circumcision or uh, so it, it can be portrayed, multiculturalism can be portrayed as an enemy of gender equality, freedom of speech, so forth. And so in that sense I think there are multiple avenues by which you've had this challenge to multiculturalism as well. And of course immigration, I mean immigration is a politicized issue in most European countries um, and if you just look at the, uh, the election here in campaigning here in Britain, going back to Michael Howard of the Tories, but also Labour uh, feels the need to, to counteract that rhetoric and also show itself to be tough on immigration. And there's a movement within the Labour Party called Blue Labour, um, which is explicitly said we must uh, reconnect with our, uh, our working class base. And one of the ways we need to do this is by getting rid of rhetoric about uh, post-nationalism and multiculturalism and returning to, to a narrative of Britishness and a narrative of, of reduced immigration. So that's quite interesting as a, as a development. Anyhow.